afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Action Bulletin. It's Tuesday afternoon. It's Field CEO this afternoon. It's myself, your host, Declan McConville. It's going to be Patrick McGilp, Lawrence Conley. Gentlemen, how are we? Doing well. What a game at the weekend. Everybody in the world of self, it's got to be happy. Yeah. We sure are happy. Um, we'll be looking uh, right over that game at the weekend because it is probably... The best performance, arguably, under Ange Postecoglou in the, the league so far. It's probably one of the most dominant away performances I've ever watched as a Celtic fan. It was all one-way traffic for large periods of the game. Um, and we'll be looking at transfer links. We're seeing Celtic link to three players from the J-League. We'll be looking at Thursday's match. Um, that's the, the headline, uh, our bullet line today. Is we want everyone up and running. These comes from Ange's comments uh, picked up on in the Daily Record last night when he was speaking about the game on Thursday, saying there's no such thing as a dead robber at Celtic. Patrick, come to you first. Um, Dundee United away was always going to be a hard fixture. After Thursday night's injuries, uh, Jota, Stephen Welsh, and for Alston, it looked as though it was even going to be even tougher, but no issues whatsoever. No, none at all. And, you know, the last two games against Dundee United have been pretty tough. Hate to bring the mood down, but we, we, we lost a league title the last time we went to Tanadice, and then we drew 1-1 one, one, very disappointingly at the end of September. Um, yeah, the last time we played them at home so no, expecting a tough game and even with all those injuries racking up you thought, you know if we're going to drop points in December it's probably going to be happening soon but then out of nowhere well not out of nowhere but semi-surprisingly you get the most dominant away performance of the last seven or eight years uh, certainly statistically and on the eye as well I mean we're absolutely immense first half uh, Tom Rogic um Called upon his inner Paddy McCourt, his inner Lino Messi to score the first goal. And then the, the pass from uh, McGregor and the, the touch from Turnbull for the, for the second as well. It's absolutely phenomenal. Um, and the second half wasn't too bad either. No, the second half wasn't too bad either. And that third goal certainly sealed the deal in the second half. Um, Lawrence Knight, Lino Messi's got posters of Tom Rodgers in his wall. He's studying videos how to how improve his game, isn't he? Week in week, he's getting them sent over. I tell you what, young skills, what a composed finish. I know it took it to the deflection, but the way he opened his body, didn't panic. Just another player with minutes in his legs. So it's all good. Good to see Taylor back. I thought much better balance to the team. We just seemed to move it quicker, which probably resulted in, you know, was part of that performance. The fact that it was more natural having a left back at left back. Mm, yeah, I thought Greg Taylor played well at uh, the weekend, coming back in, especially. After that pass that you touched on there, the, the last time we played at Tanadice, it was the game that we ultimately succumbed to losing the league title. Um, something I've spoken about a lot is mentality for the Celtic team. Um, what did it say about some of them that were there on Sunday, that played in that game a few months back, that they could go up there and just you know see it out, no bother, and, and play to, to what Ange has been asking them to do so? Um, well, I mean, off the top of my head, I can only think of three players that played in both games. Um you know, I think it was maybe McGregor, Turnbull and Rogic that played in both games. Um, I'm not even sure if Rogic played back in March because um, it, it is a totally new side we've got, effectively. Um, but no, I mean, mentality-wise, you know, there's a lot of games. It's two games a week, basically, for the first half of the, the season. Uh, so to keep on grinding out results... Oh, he's dropped out. To keep on grinding out results, um, you know... Lawrence, it is pretty impressive that even after you know disappointments in Europe and a tough September, we can still keep on going and just sort of you know grind, to put out a performance like that when we've been playing two games a week for four months. It is it's really impressive. I you know, listen, United are one of the better teams I've played, so I was worried about going away to Tanadice, but you know I was looking at running games. I've got quite a few home games coming up, but thinking Tanadice is going to tell us kind of what type of a team we are. You, you know that. that They've been on. They've had a fairly decent season so far under uh, Tamil Court, and you're, I thought, yeah, United is a decent team. They've caused us problems at, early, at, at Celtic Park. This is really going to be a measure of how far we progress since then. And as you say, it's never felt we we're going to lose a goal. Never mind, you know, drop any points. It was just so dominant. Yeah, it was so incredibly dominant. dominant. Um... Yeah, I've just about to say, ten of the listeners, I'm having bad, bad Wi-Fi problems, not affected by storms, but um, I'm just having a disaster. So if I do drop in and out, my apologies, um, Patrick, and you're the capable answer, Patrick Lawrence. Um, 
Patrick, I'll come back to you on this one. Starfelt and Vickers, um, it was a partnership that was really developing um, before Carlos Starfelt picked up that injury. Obviously, Vickers was at the game last week due to personal reasons. Um, but together, they just look so solid. And, um, you know, for a you know, defence that was in crisis for, for many parts, reported by the mainstream media, two of them just looks as if they've got such a great understanding of each other. And I thought Vickers at the weekend was, was immense. He just keeps everything so, so simple. And it just looks as if nothing's too much for him. Yeah, and you know, I think they probably complement each other pretty well because Vickers isn't the fastest of players and Starfield isn't that comfortable, you know, passing the ball. Although he doesn't make that many mistakes, you can tell he's 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 not the most comfortable uh, passing out from the back. But they both sort of they, they help each other uh, with their weaknesses. They 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 make sure they, they they cover for each other. There's not many mistakes between them, uh, and they're, they're two of the the most important players on our side. I know. I mean, you can talk about Kyogo and Jota, but Starfield and Vickers are equally as important because, you know, with Angie's system, we want to be going forward all the time, but as Angie said several times, he doesn't pop corks or champagne corks for clean sheets. He just wants to limit the opposition's chances because if they don't have chances, they can't score. Um, and them, I mean, I, don't, I think Carter Vickers has been sensational since he came in, but Starfield's improvement... Uh, since he, since his uh, shaky start at Tynecastle has been, you know, it's been phenomenal and it's been really really important to our success. And he's he's arguably our most important player just now. Yeah, definitely. And, and you know, defence centre defence has always been a position that I think even you know in recent years when we've had success, it's still been a position that we've been weak in and we've not always trusted the players there. But just now we do seem to have two real solid defenders. Um, Lawrence. Uh, the injury to Tony Ralston last week gave us a chance to see Josip Juranovic go to his natural position at, at right back um, on Thursday evening and then he started there at the weekend what did you make of him at, at right back did, did you see much difference in his game compared to when he plays at left I th- think uh, I was, for, for the opinion it was much a similar performance or did they just I thought it looked to be a bit more comfortable at right back to be honest if, you know Dundee United tried that ball every time for Charlie McGrew uh, down our right hand channel and they never get any joy because Juranovic just dealt with it all the time or Vickers took the step across and he uh, got in there. Defensively, you know, he was sound. Uh, kind of, I suppose, midfield did a couple of slack packet passes. Got up the line a lot more and, and, and put in some decent crosses. I think there's a bit more finesse about his crosses, that, whereas Tony just seems to hammer them across sometimes. But yeah. Probably the only way he was going to get the jersey off of Alston was Alston getting injured. So, unfortunately, you know, Tony's getting injured. But we've got a right back that can step in and, and Greg Taylor's back. You know, it's it just gives such a, I thought, better balance to the whole team having Greg there. Uh, yeah, you, you know, you have no worries, I think, about Juranovic, whether he plays left or right back. The only worry is, is he going to stay on penalties or are we going to give them to someone else? Because I'd quite like to, to see him staying on the penalties. Yeah, as long as he doesn't give us too many hearts and mouths, won't be panakers, but as long as he hits the back <laughs> of net, none of us are really that bothered. Um, Patrick, Greg Taylor, for you know, a long part of his Celtic career, has been one of the scapegoats in the team. Um, probably due to the fact that a lot of the guys around him just are better football players, but in the Ralston mould, he does a job for us. Um, what did you make him coming back in? I know he was getting high praise in terms of his stats in the game. It was his first game back for a long time. Um important to you know get him back I think at this point in time of the season isn't it yeah well I mean in a performance with so many standouts you're arguably better not having a standout performance as a defender because you're looking at all these midfield and attacking players creating so many chances and we're giving them nothing at the back and so you don't really get to see people like Taylor and uh, Jovanovic and Carter Vickers and Starfield and that's that's maybe what you want because if those players are to stand out it might be because of a mistake um, so yeah, I, I mean, I, I didn't think he was. It wasn't like a man of the match performance. I thought he'd done well for his first. Uh, I think it's his first start back. I might be right in saying uh, one of his first games back anyway. And I think it does. I think it brings better balance to the team. I think even Mikey Johnson looks slightly better um, with a with a left back behind him as opposed to a right back. Not to say Jovanovic done badly at left back. It just. Gives more balance to the team, makes the team more comfortable because Jovanovic is making passes and taking touches and putting crosses in with his right foot on the left side. And mm. it, I think it slows the game down a bit because you're taking an extra touch or two. So it's coming even in if. Inside. Yeah. Aye, exactly. So even if Taylor isn't the most accomplished 
at least he can put in crosses first time as as opposed to having to cut back and can make passes first time. So I think it's it quickens the game up a bit, which is is only good news for us. Yeah, absolutely. Lawrence, I looked at a graphic um, from the game on Sunday there and it showed Greg Taylor and Juranovic in very advanced position during about the halfway line, leaving the two centre halves to sit. We'll, we'll come on to um, Callum McGregor in that number six position. But it then allowed um, the central areas for us to overload in, in the central areas, which I think really caught them the United off guard. We also saw, when we spoke about the genius of Tom Rodgers earlier on, dropping wide to get that ball. Um, I think, you know, some the point that you said earlier on, it did look as if there was a greater balance to that Celtic team. And again, you've got guys slotting back in like Greg Taylor, knows where he's to be, and it's just playing to that post glue system that we became so familiar with. Yeah, but, I mean, I don't think it's any... You know, it's not a chance that Ange came out in early in the season and praised Taylor and Ralston for the way they've played the for him as inverted fullbacks. The balance is brilliant. Patrick touched on it. Taylor just moves the ball quicker because it's on his left. It's just more natural where Juranovic is having to just take an extra touch and it slows it down and gives the other team a wee bit of time to get settled. Well, invert fullbacks, it's overloading the midfield, isn't it? And it's just giving us those extra players, freeing Roger to do, do his magic. And yeah, brilliant. Turnbull, the great, you know, it was a great goal. Don't think it was his, his best performance. But Mikey Johnston, it was good to see him get 90 minutes. I, I think he's not back to the level he can get to, but it was a better performance than he's, he's had recently. And he, he, I think he, he's a guy that really needs to rebuild his confidence. You know, Taylor, I think, helped a bit. But maybe it's just minutes as well. You know, I just touched on that. He needs to get everyone up and running. We need people that can just come in like Greg and, <laughs> and just slot right in. And, you know, you're not noticing. You, you know, there's no degradation in the team when Greg Taylor comes in. If anything, you know, it lifted a wee bit. So we, we need players like that. And, and Cal Mack back to number six. <sighs> The, the boy's just amazing, isn't he? Just everywhere. It's, you know, but we're spoiled for number sixes now, I think. You know, you've got Beto and McCarthy, Cal Mack. Don't know where that leaves Sorrell. Yeah, you, you know, I don't know if he's maybe one that's going to be, we'll try and move on in, in January, but he's got to be fourth choice out, out of those, hasn't he? So, yeah. And the front three it was just immense. And, and obviously that's where Ange is looking to bring in you know, another reinforcement there. But yeah, it, it's all looking good. You know, if you put in performances like that, you're not going to lose games. No, um, Pat, Patrick. On that, you know, the overload in the opposition in central areas. Um, a lot's been spoke about on here, especially between the three years about that midfield getting the balance right. But McGregor at number six on Sunday was absolutely sensational. Some of the passes he was picking out, his positional play was excellent. He was covering for the you know staff out and Vickers, which I think gives them greater confidence in the game. If we play like that every week, is that the midfield that we go with? Or would you like to see McGregor, you know, doing what Roger and Turnbull was doing and getting into those advanced positions? Because we know Carl McGregor likes a goal as well. But for a lot of the times in the game, he was getting right up there and about it too and probably was unlucky not to score his cell. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, his influence, he just sort of pulling the strings. It's it's unbelievable, really, just how good he is. Um, I've, I, I think I've said a few times, I think he's the best midfielder in Scotland uh, on his day. I know. Far. I know people like uh, I know people like Rogic, but I, I still think it's Callum McGregor, um, and I think Sunday showed that he certainly staked a claim. But uh, no, that's the midfield that I would play most of the time uh, with him in the six and Turnbull and Rogic ahead of him. Uh, obviously, you need to rotate. You can can he play the same three guys fifty games a season? You know, you have players like McCarthy and Beaton that can come in. You can move McGregor forward. Um, you even seen him at left wing under under Rogers in that twenty seventeen eighteen season. I don't think I'd like to see that again if I'm being honest. But he can play a multitude of positions and uh, but the looks of things so can Hatati who will be coming in awfully soon. Um so it gives us even more cover. Uh, but no. I, I prefer him in that sixth role. Maybe not in Europe. Maybe I'd like to see his go a wee bit more defensive in Europe. Maybe bring in Beaton and McCarthy, but or, or even to slow the game down if we're two or three nil up domestically, and maybe move McGregor forward then. But no, when we're playing domestically and we're, we're trying to play free flowing attacking football, uh, I'd like to see McGregor in the role he was in. The role he was in on Sunday. Yeah, I thought when near beat on came on Lawrence, he looked very comfortable again. He was pinging passes about like nobody's business. Um, but again, it's just good that we've got players that can come off the bench and just slot in so comfortable, so easily, which is just something that, you know. 
we've asked a lot of questions about the squad, but now we're starting to see the squad being used a wee bit better than managed and players getting up to the speed that the manager probably wants. It wasn't that he was badly managing the players, it was just that the fitness levels of players just wasn't there at that moment in time. Um, but but looking at that and Callum McGregor, Lawrence, are you quite happy now to you know leave him where he is as that number six if he plays like that week in, week out, or would you like to see him in that more advanced position getting and end up the balls that he was playing um, to David Timber, which again is absolutely fantastic. Oh, I didn't realise how good it was. I mean, I was at the other end of the stadium in the shade, and I, I never knew, you know, the touch over the goal. He's definitely meant it. It's absolutely terrific goal. Well, I think he's wasted at number six. He's brilliant, but we've got, you know, another two crack at number six. He's there. I just think he's better further forward, and it's probably further forward where we lack options in the, in the midfield. You know, yeah, we've got Turnbull. Project and as McGregor, you're thinking, well, who else? So, but you know, Ange says he wants to get everybody up to, to speed and maximize the squad. Maybe it is rotating them round and, and you know, horses for courses. Maybe we think, you know, the team's up against a weaker team. Maybe then play McGregor a wee bit deeper because you're going to, you know, have more of the ball and go, go forward more. But yeah, for me, I'd like to see him playing forward and, and getting back in amongst the goals. Uh, one thing that's left me wondering, you know, we've got the best defence in Scotland so far, and I'm wondering what Dan was on about, about Ange doesn't care about defence, because it seems to be one of the first things he's sorted out. <laughs> you, you know, it's kind of going, for a guy who doesn't care about defence, it seems to be, right, he's sorted that, and, and now that that seems a steady platform to build on, you're starting to see more variation in a play. Whether that's because the squad's, learning more in training week on week and how they want to play and he's just kind of gradually building it I don't know but for me it seems to kind of I've thought of that defence first of all so whoever sits in front of it we've got three good options McGregor, Beaton and, and McCarthy uh, you know, Beaton was just I thought it was great just his, his range of passing is just phenomenal isn't it uh, hopefully he'll get back amongst the goals he used to score a couple of long range efforts but yeah no for me McGregor further forward for me I prefer seeing him further forward but Listen, Ange knows his stuff. If he thinks he's he's better playing at number six, I'll, I'll just kind of bow to Ange's wisdom. Yeah, I think we're all doing that. I um, saw a tweet the other day saying, you know, we're all living in Ange post the Cocos world and whatnot. So, yeah, we certainly are. In fact, we're, we're rolling back the years with some Celtic players, Celtic players that I think a lot is. Me for one, you know, I, I probably know opposition to Tom Rogic heading to Qatar in the summer uh, the other year. Uh, beat on if you'd have told me you know, a couple of million quid, I'd probably had them out the door. But, you know, Ange Postacoglu certainly turned these guys for him around. Um, Bob Mc, McMillan's came in in the comments to say, Roger showed grit and determination, something I wouldn't say about him previously. Um, I, I would say we've seen that, you know, in flashes from Tom Roger, but see a goal like that at the weekend, Pat, it, it just lifts everybody around you because you just see one individual where he gets the ball, I think he goes past four or five players. It's absolutely outrageous to score a goal like that. And the lift that must give players around him you know, it's de- certainly something that gives you a right confidence boost in a, in a game like that, a, a, a venue like that at Tanadice. Hundred percent, and <clears throat> I think he runs faster with the ball than he does without the ball. Uh, he said there about grit and determination as well. He was putting in some of challenges. I mean, I've, I don't think I've ever seen Roger put in that many Just challenges. Successful challenges as well. I am said that Andrew's talking about how you can't get the ball off him because he's so strong, and it, it might not look that way when, when you're watching him because sometimes his touches look a bit. You think he's going to lose the ball and he just sort of pulls something from nowhere and he manages to dribble around a few cool. players. Well, it's unbelievable. It's like a, 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 a string to his, uh, a string to his boot. Um, I think it's the, the futsal. Because he's oh, a right. futsal player, isn't it? You, you, aye, you know, that's aye. kind of... I think it's amazing how he's managed to carry that over. Aye. But I mean, you can see the strength when he's when he's trying to win the ball back and he, he done that successfully so many times on Sunday. And I think we, we're probably missing that in the early part of the season, both him and Turnbull. Were a bit, you know, powder puff, but lightweight, and players were running and passing right through them, uh, and it sort of left uh, Starfield and I think probably Welsh at the time with quite a lot to do, but then the midfielders have sort of toughened up a bit, put in a few more challenges, and then Carter Vickers and Starfield have improved as well. So it shows you, you know, that's the reason we're not conceding many goals. Yeah, no, 100%. And just to give the boys at Social Recluse a wee shout out for this t-shirt, I think they probably do still have some left. It's part of the campaign in 2019, or, no, 2020, sorry. It says under it, where you went, others follow. Obviously, a tribute to Celtic's greatest ever captain. Um, 
and you know defender and as Lawrence was saying there we talked about defending Lawrence has it just been a seamless transition under Ange Postecoglou where he's not needed to focus on the defence too much because we attack so well and anything that does come at the back just seems to be dealt with so so simply by they get the guys that are there because you know the two centre halves just look now like very comfortable natural defenders that keep it very simple I know Celtic fans get a bit wary when we start passing the ball around the back but you know there has been mistakes come from that this season, but two of them are showing that are decent players and uh, we'll get on to Vickers' price there because somebody's talking about that in the comments, but is it just that we go forward so much we don't really need to worry about that defence? I don't think so. I think, you know, a big change is Joe Hart. I think it really gives the confidence, even if he, he was a bit light in one of his balls across the front of goal uh, on his touches. Uh, I think we've all seen the defence improving. You know, there has, at the beginning of the season, I don't know if they had the confidence that they have now when it comes to passing it round about the back. And I think that's grown just the more they do it. That, that you know, they're quite relaxed now with Angie's instructions saying, you know what, we can't take it. We can't, you know, the boys in 10 yards of space, it's an easy pass to him. I don't need to worry about it. It's not just kind of lump it forward now. Seamless. We've not lost a lot of goals, but I'd definitely say that, you know, there's an up, upwards trajectory of, of the defensive performance. Welsh was unlucky to, to, to miss out, but I think that it is going to be Starfield and Carl Vickers as our best partnership. God knows where, if Julian will ever be fit again, it's it's one of those ones, isn't it? You're going, what's well, keeping him out? You know, the, the, the Celtic physios must be scratching their heads as to why he's um, feeling twinges. But to be honest, is he going to be missed if, if those two is kind of keep, keep putting in performances like that? Probably not. You know, maybe he's another one that needs to get off the ways bill if he doesn't want to come back and play. Yeah, there probably needs to be a fine balance for that. Obviously, we don't know too much about Chris Julian at this point in time. Patrick, we ourselves, you know, we've not seen him feature for nearly a year now, but we probably would prefer him not to be rushed back to soon if he is going to then be out for another three or four months. But, um, yeah, I think as Lawrence says there, you know, just now I think it's quite solidified with the Vickers and Starfield and if even Julian was fat I think he would be on the bench for us at this point in time 100% you know he would probably be joint with uh, Welsh as a sort of third option because um, there, there's nobody going to you know on ability wise or, or performance wise nobody's going to sort of dislodge Starfield or Carter Vickers at the moment um, yeah I mean it, what, when he's going to be back we don't know it'll probably be January now if not later um, unless I'm just going to pull another one of his tricks and says, oh, he's not ready, he's not ready, and then starts him, uh, like he did with McGregor and Kyogo against Leverkusen. But I think it'll probably be January. And, you know, with squad rotation, you know, Starfield, I think, uh, and Carter Vickers to an extent, have played quite a lot of games. You know, Starfield had his sort of injury and he, he get rested in that period. But, you know, squad rotation is important, so he'll, he'll certainly get some game time. But, I don't think he's he's part of the starting paving um, if he was to come back tomorrow. Um, Lord, it's going to come to you in this one. Jimmy Young's coming in the comments to, to say that, you know, Vickers has been quoted at two and a half to three million now pay at Celtic. The, the thing I read said 10 million. I think you've seen that as well, Patrick. If the fee was that high, and if he paid seven for Julian, what will be um, two and a half years ago, I think, uh, two and a half years ago, come January time. Yep. Um, and it will be, you know, three years in the summer. Would you gamble in ten million? Probably not a gamble. Gamble's the wrong word. Would you pay ten million pounds for Cameron Carter Vickers if you, you paid seven for Julian? We know he's a player. I mean, we know he's only probably going to get better for us. He's really important to the Sanchez Postal Club. I, I don't think it's how much you paid for Julian decides how much you pay for Carter Vickers. I think it's just what's that, your transfer a marker, though. So I think it comes down to what's your transfer pot. Where else needs strengthened? And if your transfer pot's ten million, are you going to all blow? It's, it's like we could have kept Robbie Keane. Gordon Strachan had the opportunity to buy Robbie Keane or buy not buy Robbie Keane and buy another three players. So or was it Bellamy? I can't remember. But he don't, sorry, it was Bellamy the option to buy and keep Bellamy. Bellamy. Yeah, but he decided not to. And then because it, the team needed improvement and he, it, the transfer pot was only so big, is he worth ten million? I think it's hard to say so far. Uh, you know, he's decent. He's twenty-three. American. 
I think the two and a half, if, if I've got that agreed, it's a no-brainer to kind of activate that. But when you go up to 10 million, you're, you're, you're really looking at your budget, aren't you? Because it's a, that's a huge chunk. If you're it's 10 in him, how much is Yota? Six and a half, seven and a half? You know. Six and a half, I think. So that'd be 16 and a half between just those two. For, for much of the team standing still, I know you get to retain them in the team, but you're kind of going, right, where's money to improve the team then? So, yeah, it, it, it's going to, going to see how, I suppose, whoever comes in in this January window works out that and, and who we sell. Listen, if we can get five million for, for Barkas and a Yeti, for, you know, for both of them, buy one, get one free deal or something, it makes it easier to invest, doesn't it? But, yeah, ten million's a lot, lot for us. I can't remember the last time he spent. You know, that what was it, Edward? Was he nine and a half? Yep, it was nine. Yep, nine. never spent ten million pound. Yeah, it's kind of. So Edward's yeah, listen. We made money on Edward. <coughs> uh, I don't know how he's going on now. If I if we're going to make any money now, I sell on. But I do think I want to blow all that on, on Carter Vickers. I think it, you, you need to just kind of look at things in the in the round and see. Where, how much money you've got in total and where else needs strengthened. Yeah. Um, Patrick, obviously, what it's touched on, they were going to come on to the three boys from the J League, but it could be a fine balance here because, you know, I've been keeping up to date with Dan, who's appeared in Axon before. Um, he's a Japanese football journalist over there. And he's speaking about the price tags of the three boys that we're linked with just down basically, you know, and around about being saying it would be daylight robbery for the prices that were getting quoted <laughs> at in the Japanese media to bring them over here. Um, could it be that fine balance that we, we, you know, we exploit markets that we don't usually go into, pick up some real gems um, and players, and then we look to, you know, using the bulk of the transfer um, budget that as Lawrence touched on, on players like Jota and Vickers, that it's probably likely that we are going to get a, you know, decent sell on for eventually, and are very important to the manager's system. Yeah, um, I'm not entirely sure of the price in total for the three guys we're going to be bringing in in January. Uh, I know one of them's a bit of a weird one. He's not meant to be that impressive. But Hatate and Maeda are meant to be pretty good. And then you've obviously got Kyogo as well, who I think. Well, uh, the Japanese the, um, the league's best 11 for the season, so it must be not bad. All right. Kyogo finished our top goal scorer. He left halfway through. So there you go. Mm. Uh, and he was a, apparently a steal, and I think we'd agree he was a steal. I think we got him for something like three or four million. Um, I can't quite remember, but I think ten million for Carter Vickers. I don't think you can justify that if I'm being perfectly honest. I know he's been impressive, but I think you can get a player just as good as Carter Vickers for less. Starfield has been, you know, man of the match the last couple of games in my opinion, and we got him for five. And he took a month or two to settle in, but in the course of three or four years, what's a month or two? Um, so I, I I wouldn't pay ten million for Carter Vickers. Not only that, because I heard there was a contract at the end of the season. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know. I don't know what's true because you know yeah, uh, the guy in the comments said three. We've read ten, and then I've also seen uh, a freebie on Twitter. So we'll see what happens. I wouldn't pay ten personally. Um, with Jota though, I think I would probably pay the six and a half. Um, you think? I, th- I, don't yes, I would, I would, I would pay the six and a half. I am just thinking. You know, oh, no, he's thinking personally. Can he raise that money just in case there's any going? <laughs> uh, it's just whether Celtic decide to pay it or not. You know, because I think you know with Patrick Robertson earlier, we've seen in the past. I think we were quoted being over ten million to sign those two players. Jot is arguably better than the both of them, and Obviously we're being quoted six and a half. So, you know, it's it's whether you can get a player for slightly less than that, but at the same time, he's in our hands now. He seems to be enjoying his football. He's a young player. He's not only effective in terms of statistics and influence, but he's actually quite exciting to watch. I mean, he's he's tremendously exciting to watch every single game. Um, and he makes a good star of the Christmas ad. So what, what more do you want for £6.5 million? Pounds? Um, but, yeah, just going back on the Japanese boys, sort of exciting to see what they bring. Um I think my aid is a sort of winger slash striker and the other two are midfielders. Uh, so we're coming into positions where we, we do need the depth. Um, and if we can get them in at one minute past midnight on the 1st of January, that would help as well. Yeah, that'd be a, a big lift, and especially going away, Lawrence, um, to winter training camp. And that kind of you know ties in here with one of the points David Kelly's made in the comments, saying that, that Taylor has become another player who gets better while injured, which I think is a really important point. And what Patrick was talking about in Starfield there, 
is it that some of these guys, when they get that wee rest and go out, come back in and just look so, so comfortable in this system because they're getting a chance to work on it? They were spoken about international breaks and letting some of the guys, you know, work with Ange during that time. But is it a possibility that, you know, once we get into the uh, January and we get these couple of weeks training, we could see a completely different Celtic side when they come back because the time period that Ange had to work with the core of the team when he came out wasn't a lot in terms of the players that are there that make up the 11 Jota wasn't there Vickers wasn't there um, Starfield came in very late Hart many many players there that probably haven't had the time with Ange in the, the training ground that he would like to have had you know could we see a different Celtic team come January when we come back I, I hope so we've got a manager that's got a reputation of developing young players and he does that on the training ground and be spending time with them and working on, on them and, and getting his ideas across so you know the more time he gets to spend with them you know, he, he's get a bigger opportunity to influence them and in how they perform on the, on the park I don't know if David with Kelly's maybe meaning he's uh, I, I think Taylor takes a lot of stick actually really rate me Greg but he takes a lot of stick so I think he's some people say it gets better when he's injured, i.e. we forget how bad he's been beforehand. And you know, But for me, you know, he's got a good assist record, Scotland International. The two boys keep him out of the team are Robertson and Tierney. He's, what, 23? You know, he's, he's got loads of room to develop. I mean, that's that's a really young defence, if you look across it. Uh, so, yeah, that, I think we will see a better team the, lo- the more time Ange's got to to work with them, you know, we're just back after an international break and look at the performance we put in. You know, mm. arguably, you know, a lot of that will be down to Ange getting more time to work with them. I think as we, we go on, the, the team st- seems to be varying the, the play more and whether that's they learn a, a bit of Ange's system and he goes, right, you've got that, now add this bit in and add this bit in. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, Jared talked about it from, you know, uh, Boys Down Under that your first season is really about building and getting the team to play. It's the second season they really go. So you can see this team kind of pr- pr- progressing uh, I, throughout the season. So it'd be brilliant to watch uh, next season if Jared's right. <laughs> you know, if the second season is going to be even better than performances this season, it's going to be, I think, phenomenal. Mm, 2022 could be quite a, a thrilling year to watch Celtic, Patrick. But um, there's a few important points, I think, that, that Lawrence touches on there and, you know, players coming back in, adapting to the system, adding bits to the system. But one of the, the points he's, he's touched on there is, since we've come back after the break, it's been high pressure games. I don't want to bring you it's a lot of pressure, but we've come through a semi-final of the League Cup and a game that was always going to be very difficult. Came through it. Um, two great wins at home to, to Aberdeen and Hart. You know, the best uh, performances to watch, but, you know, six points between them. Um, and games that we really deserved to win. I thought we were very dominant in both games in terms of that. And again, you know, we missed out in, in Leverkusen. Um, probably was a worry between us because we'd get such a great run of form between the, the previous international break and up until that one. And we've came back and again just slipped right back into where we were. Um, it, it just shows the, kind of the feel-good factor that must be around Lennox too, just there. And you can see that in the park when you've got the the players interact with the fans and the manager interact with the fans. Everything just there is positive. And in a few weeks' time, Ange has the chance to kind of you know tick a box off and hopefully bring back Silverware to Celtic Park. Yeah, and you know in the first week of that last international break when he won the October Manager of the Month award, he, he was quoted as saying he's sort of been avoiding looking at the, the heavy fixture list he's got. Um, but you know we, we've handled it pretty well with. The results we've had, if you're to say to me before the international break, would you take that? I'd have certainly taken it so far. You know, to narrowly miss out on a, a result away to Leverkusen is phenomenal, especially when you consider the scoreline in the first game. And then just to go back to your 2022 comment, I think Anne shared on Sky, um, I think midweek last week, that he's actually 12 months away from being where he wants to be at. And, you know, we, th- we think we're flying just now. If he's right about what he's saying, then we're going to be some team this time next season uh, but you know it's going well um, you know you've just got another I think you've got I, Ange didn't say it's a rest for certain players it's a it's a chance for other players to play and I think it's a bit of both really because I think we do need to rest certain players um, I think I read that David Turnbull was the only player to start every single game this season so he is, he's one that yeah. you'd definitely be resting uh, against Betis on Thursday uh, McGregor kind of had time out in September but he was injured so 
and he's been playing for Scotland during all the international breaks when other players have had a rest. So you'd maybe look at resting him. Kyogo's effectively played a full season now, um, so you'd be resting him as well. And then you're maybe looking at players like, I don't know, Abada maybe. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. But you, you're probably taking three or four players out for Betis and try to rotate the squad a bit and then just back onto league business against Motherwell because at home you have to fancy yourself the way we're playing. We have, you have to fancy yourself and, you know, it's just another opportunity to sort of uh, cement the style and uh, improve under Ange. Yeah, Motherwell will be a, a tough fixture. Obviously, Tony Watt is the league's top goal scorer at this point in time, so they, they'll, they'll come to Celtic Park and, you know, try their luck against us. And again, at first part, they're very, very dominant performance from us. Um, it was two going in four or five. Um, but Rolls came in in the comments to Lawrence to say we'd like to see Scales have 90 minutes against Betis. Now, the comment that was spoke, uh, sorry, that as a tackle, we want everyone up and running. Um, you know, he's came off the, the bench on Sunday. But obviously, we've seen flag of him. We've seen him uh, play against Phoenix Barros. Um, we've seen him against Dave Rovers, etc. Great goal to come on, but looked really composed as well in the back four. And you know, it would be good to get all these guys up and running. I think Thursday's a real opportunity that because Patrick touches on there. You know, Sunday's more important than Thursday, just due to the fact that it's not a dead rubber. You know, we, we won't sell to win on Thursday, of course we do, but the three points is much more important against Motherwell than it will be against Real Betis. Yeah, but definitely. I think with, with, with scales, the problem is we've got uh, Taylor who also needs minutes, so we might see both of them for forty-five minutes. You know, but, but yeah, we, we, you know, Ange said it, he wants to get everyone up and running. You might see McCarthy and Beaton both uh, in the midfield. Uh, uh, you know, maybe McGregor further forward, maybe Roger, because Roger's only just back. But it, it, it's definitely a time where uh, we've got a bit of luxury in this game, haven't we? It, 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 you know, it doesn't matter if we want to lose or draw on this. It's it's really about Ange using it to, to get the best out of his squad, get them prepared for. They're onto the transfer window opening. I mean, everything seems to be going our way these days. We've got even re- got referees making decisions for us. It was all over the news last week. I'm sure we're going to see something similar this week on the decisions that didn't go for us. Uh, no doubt uh, the head of referee, or he can't remember his name, he'll be coming out on BBC pretty shortly just to, to talk about it. Yeah, and um, Patrick, it's good to see that some people have managed to move on for 1989 and Roy Aitken's throw in. Um, <laughs> to, to look at this um, another comment coming in from one of our regular contributors is saying that we can't just assume that all three Japanese guys will settle as easily as Kyogo um, he's thrown in the names of Patrick Berg and, and Kevin Nesbitt um, is that a worry because obviously you know we're all very excited about looking at the Japanese market we looked at the J League but Ange just said he knew what he was getting with Kyogo he was 26 he knew he was going to settle he would adapt to the culture is there a wee bit of a worry that you know all three of them may come in on one or two might not adapt to Scotland so quickly and then you might have a bit of an issue and what do you make the other two players there that's been mentioned in Bergen is but um, is but sorry I think the only I mean the only players that haven't really adapted to Scotland you could maybe say Barkas but you don't know if that's a confidence thing I think with a Yeti you could say a Yeti's not adapted but I just think he's a, he's a bad football player if I'm being honest I just don't think he's good enough um, maybe the price tag didn't help but He's not shown anything to prove to me that he's a Celtic level player, Celtic quality player. Um, on the players mentioned, I mean, if Patrick Baird comes in, McGregor's definitely getting moved forward because you've got to play a player like Patrick Berg and you can't be dropping Callum McGregor. Um, if we sign Patrick Berg, I'll be very excited about next season. Uh, I'll be very excited about the next uh, half of this season as well because he's been phenomenal in the Europa League for is it Bodo Glimt, I think he plays for. Mm-hmm. Um, Kevin is, but I'm not that sold on. Um, I sort of wanted us to sign him in the summer, but he's not had the best of starts uh, this season at Hibs. It's hard to tell with players at other clubs in Scotland how good they are or not. Um, I wouldn't mind taking a punt on him, but anything over two and a half or three million, I'd probably pass on that. I think we can get better elsewhere. We can probably get better in Japan, or you know, Ange mentioned South Korea in the media as well. That's another league I think we're going to be looking at. And I think we, we spoke about Iran on the podcast last week as well. So, you know, there's there's loads of markets all over the world that we could be uh, diving into. And to spend any sort of uh, money on Kevin Nisbet, I'm not just too sure. 
yeah, um, you know, I've seen them in flashes, you and I, uh, for Scotland as well. I was seeing them for Hibs, it was very hard to judge them. But um, Lawrence, the few players that we're looking at in the G League just said were being linked at, as Patrick said, as Maeda, left winger slash striker. Um, Hatati, who we know can play as a defender and they can play in midfield. The other chap escapes him, but six and he plays as a central defensive midfielder. Um, these are all positions that we probably do need to stay in for him. You know, if we can get these deals done, it's a no-brainer. Um, but there obviously is that worry against work permits and stuff like that because it's going to be difficult. But, you know, COVID, we know, hasn't went away and try to get them in and, and what knows going to be, be tough. But if we can get those deals done and if that's what Ange wants, then we need, we need to get them done as soon as possible and not hang about like we usually do in any transfer window. Yeah, you'd want them, these three in the first day, wouldn't you? You know, the deal's done and uh, hopefully no delays in registrations or anything. Just get them in and, and registered in time or everything approved to, to go straight into the squad. Maeda looks rapid. I, I think, you know, he's worked under and He'd really compliment Kyogo on his pressing. He, he looks so quick. It's a market, Ange knows. He, you know, he's had a look at the squad and it, he said it's 12 months away. You know, one of these guys might just be a stopgap. Saying look, we'll see what it gives us over the twelve months. Who knows? But but I wouldn't get him in. This bat thinks you know a decent player, but it's, it's the amount of money we'd need to spend on him. I, I think we've touched on it. It's you know we generally don't spend loads in in January. I, I think Hibs would be looking for four or five million from it from this bit. And I think for us, you know, how many players could we get for that money? What kind of quality of players could we get? You know, the five million might buy all three players for Japan uh, potentially. So. I think it probably rules out uh, Nisbet Berg again. It, it's cash number six. I think we've got three crack at number six. He's a, for, for me, it's pro, you know under and, and sorrow there. So I wouldn't say we need to bring in another number six. You know we've got McGregor, McCarthy, Beaton. I think you know left back. I think we all recognise Taylor could do with a bit of competition there. You know a lot of people don't think he's first choice. Maybe we should be buying somebody of Juranovic's quality for left back, but but then we've got uh, scales, and have we really seen enough of scales to judge? Judge him. We look composed when he came on. The way he turned that finish was, I, I, I thought it was brilliant. It was like a striker taking it away, he opened up his body, and it, it, you know, he, defenders are are more uh, likely to just absolutely lash that over the bar, aren't they? But but he was so composed with it. So I think we we just kind of need to get through and say the midfield really needs strength, and I, I think it's our attacking options that are are lacking. Giacomacchus, it just seems wasn't fit, injured, not up to speed. I think we're really needing another option up front, especially you know if we could find somebody to buy a Yeti. Yeah, I'm not too sure if we could find someone out there. Yeah, probably look for a guy with a guide dog. But yeah, it's we need to kind of go through it and see right where do we need strength and. And I think, you know, up front, there are attacking options. Mm. Um, Idiguchi's the, the other name that, that was, uh, I forgot to have on. But uh, again, if we do bring him in, Patrick, what, what does that say about McCarthy, Solo, Beaton, if we're going by another number six? Because we certainly know the position. I don't think we do need to see anything at this point in time. Or does that tell you that the manager, one, doesn't fancy two McCarthy maybe not his signing as such and I think it's maybe just coming as that stopgap signing or is it just you know sent from the squad and we might see one depart I mean thinking on that we do have sort of three players who are well, four players who are available in that number that number six position you're then buying a defensive midfielder so that's five players you know the comment about Patrick Berg I think he, he's such a he's such a quality player that I think you know I'd be driving beat on to the airport in that scenario Uh because I think if you can get a, a player like that for a good fee, you, you have to sign him. But, you know, if we're going to be signing our, our fifth number six, um, I just don't think it's going to be happening, is it? Uh, well, you don't, I don't know. So whether it's a stopgap or not, I'm not sure, because it, you, you sort of wonder where he sees McGregor, because we'll talk about how well McGregor can play in all three positions. If we're signing a fifth player, Presumably he's going to be fifth in the pecking order. He might already be above Sorrow, you know. Uh, you just don't know. But it, you obviously don't need five players in one position. So he, he might be looking at playing McGregor further forward. And 
I think it's less likely the Japanese guy will be a stopgap. I think it's more likely that the players we've seen so far are stopgaps. Um, Possibly. Because we do have four already in there. To buy, to buy a fifth player as a stopgap, it seems a bit... I don't, I don't know if that makes sense. But you don't know. I'm sure Ange knows what he's doing. And the good thing about signing Japanese players is they're almost certainly his buys. And he is effectively the manager and the director of football in the one... Uh, in the one person, so he's revolutionising the football club, modernising the football club, in a way we probably hope Brendan Rodgers was going to do. Um, and you know, if if he thinks he's got a player, then you just need to back him and you need to get him over the line. Yeah, one hundred percent. Pinball must be a Who fan coming in here, Lawrence, to say that he thinks that a uh, Yeti would do well on a full strength team. I just think the way that we play football, the four three three. I don't think I'll be a Yeti to do it before. And I've said multiple times, you know, but the way that we bought in the summer of 2020, we were certainly setting up for a 3 5 2 of playing two slakers up front. It never came to fruition. I know we ended up going to that at 4 1 2 1 2. Um, not to give you any post traumatic stress disorders from last season, but um, I just don't think a Yeti's going to do it as an Ange post to call the team just for the amount of what was expected of the, of the front three in terms of the, the runners, what you expect. Yeah, I, I don't. It doesn't seem like a guy that closes down. He seems like you know he plays as part of a partnership up front. He plays as one of num- one of number two. Listen, it's obviously he's the third choice striker already. I think if Andrew really fancied him, we might have seen more of a development player rather than Yakimakis come in. I mean, he came in straight to number two. You know, straight away he's your, your option ahead of a Yeti. A Yeti has got you know he's come from the Premiership. He's going to be on big money. I think think it's one of those guys. You know, if you can get any money back from Brilliant, if you can get him off the wage bill, even better. It's, you know, I think he'd be on 12 grand. Uh, I, I think it would have been more than that. I think more. Yeah. Do you know what's weird? He came he from was West Ham, £5 million. Pound. I think he'll be pushing fifteen, eighteen mil, eighteen thousand 18,000 pounds a week easily. We need to give off. And he was one of those players like Skepovic that had to be persuaded, you know, it dragged out. And I think... Mm. You know what? I think Strachan said that if, if, if they don't want to come here and play in front of 60,000 and win trophies, I don't think we should be hanging about for them. I think maybe the club should learn that, you know, if it gets dragged out in public for a couple of weeks before a player will sign, they're probably not for us. I mean, look, look, look at the way there. Eddie, how or who or whatever get dragged out, that don't work. It should be, you know, a deal that I think's done quickly. Yeah, they want to play for us or don't. And I think, yeah, a, a Yeti had kind of won and sit signals from the beginning just the, the way it dragged out and if you can move him brilliant you know I think we could all say him Barkas Sorrow the three of them could, could go tomorrow as far as I'm concerned and hopefully bring in something that we can use to, to strengthen Yeah um, Michael's come in in the comments and this could be a shout he's saying sure the team in Switzerland would take him he could uh, Basel he, he did have a good record with Basel coupled by uh, Moyen Onusi over there but Again, it depends on the price tag. I mean, we're certainly not going to recoup the five million pound that we definitely spent on him. Uh, well, be his wages as well, though, for Switzerland, won't it? Yeah, yeah, it will be. He um, need to take a cut, will not he? Need to take the cut. And uh, on that, Patrick, you know, Thursday night could be another opportunity actually for Albina. Yeah, he's spoken about you know Kyogo probably getting a rest um, due to the, amount of the volume of games that he's played. You know. I'll be yeah, we've seen him obviously scored those two really important goals against Ross County this season. Um two two goals against Ross County, that right. He certainly scored against Ross County. Um I think right there. If I get their own game. Well, Carter Vickers County scored one score against either. Ross County. So we only won three yeah. nothing. Uh, was it yeah, two that, nothing? was that getting then I'm right. Well No, so Johnson was two 0 Ross County was three 0 so it was definitely aye, Ross County. Aye. Um but uh, yeah, we might you know see him in action on Thursday night. I actually thought he did okay over in Betis. I think it was a Yeti that started the game over there. Um, but yeah, probably I will be Vasilis Barkas too that you'd like to shift out just due to the, the wages that are probably taking up at this point in time. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, the cost is nine and a half million, and then they're costing us forty grand a week in wages as well for eighteen months. Past eighteen months, it's it's a phenomenal sum of money, really. I mean. You can talk about how much money you make in sell on fees with players like Edward and Aya, but it's it's totally undone by these really, really poor signings. I mean, 
I, I'd go as far as saying if one if one person was responsible for both of those players, I'd sack them because that's a terrible outlay for what you're getting back. Because you'd be lucky to get three million in sell on fees, and that would barely recoup the wages that we've paid them. So you're talking about a loss of ten million pounds uh, over the course of eighteen months. Mm. It's un- it's absolutely astounding, really, uh, for a club that's operating on a turnover of less than a hundred million. Uh, but you know, it, it probably will start uh, against Betis and you're right, he did play quite well away and I actually thought he was going to kick on a wee bit, you know yeah, uh, so did I. because yep. he, he did play that well, he was actually pressing their defenders and their goalkeeper and Angie said, you know, it was that was the game where he thought the players were really buying into what he was doing um, mm-hmm. so, you know it, it is an opportunity for him, but it's probably an opportunity for him to put himself in the short window because he's not going to make it at Celtic. I, I just can't see it. Once Maeda comes in, he's fourth choice, and you're not fighting your way back from fourth choice, I don't think. Not unless you're Tommy Coyne. No. <laughs> unless you're Tommy Coyne. I don't Sorry, boys. Think you, you, you no, I know who Tommy Coyne is. <laughs> no, I know who Tommy Coyne is. I don't think I'll be you can probably lace Tommy Coyne's boots at this point in time, though, Lord. Yeah. Um, Definitely not. Mate. If, if Coyne had an extra half yard, he'd, he'd have been playing for Madrid. I think he was. Yeah, normal. one of these points, Michael's coming in. I think it probably what we were talking about earlier, Patrick, with, with James McCarthy. I think the point me and you were making at that point in time was, you know, the, the, the squad was so threadbare. I imagine the Celtic transfer strategy in the summer was a point of, you know, offering the manager different players and telling them to pick, whereas not going out and getting his own players. So I think probably mm-hmm. Andy gave the nod to all the players that came in, bar maybe Osazio, the Gideon, and Liam Shaw, because they were already done. But the point I was trying to make is, you know, McCarthy just doesn't, on, on the basis, look as if he is an Ange post to call glue uh, signing, but he probably was given the nod to, to take him because, you know, we do know that James McCarthy is a quality player and can do it in the Premier League before we thought the four-year deal was a bit odd, but we do hope he kicks on for Celtic because we know there is a player there. Yeah, I mean, the point um, is that Ange would instigate that, the Japanese that, signings. Um, see that again, Patrick? Andrew would instigate the Japanese signings whereas you know it's it's not him who's instigating the, the James McCarthy signing or the Joe Hart signing for example not to say that they're bad players or they're bad signings you know Joe Hart's turned out to be phenomenal for £1 million pounds, but you just know that when you're signing from Japan the very first step is definitely going to be Ange mm-hmm. yeah, 100% or if we have set up any kind of uh, scouting in Japan which I do imagine what we probably did ever since Postacoglu arrived and it's probably a, a mixture between. Um, in terms of players coming in, Lawrence, you know, it was 3 nil at the weekend, but it probably could have been 6 or 7 had it not been for the man between the sticks and Seagrist um, for Dundee United. Would he be a player you'd be interested in for the right amount of money? Is, free, is he free at the end of the season? Is he, is he coming up at the end of his contract? Possibly. I don't, yeah, I don't, maybe, think, maybe. I don't think he'd be paying any more than a million quid for him anyway. I think Baines been offered a new contract. Uh, is it Toby Oluwemi? Uh, England under nineteen seems to be a big future ahead of him. We've got Ross Duhan and we've got Connor Hazard. Connor's already playing for the North of Ireland. So, yeah, it, what are we going to do with all the goalkeepers? I'm assuming by this time Barkas would be away. So, you know, if you're bringing in Seagrest. You've just given Bain a, a contract. Well, where does, where does Toby, Ross, and Connor fit in then? So, uh, for, for me, if Bain gets a contract, why are we spending money in Seagrest? I, I think that's what it comes down to because he's just going to be a blocker for the for three players that I'd like to see getting some minutes. Uh, you know, I think Connor and Ross, you know, they're about 24, aren't they? 23, 24. They've got to be looking at you like, you know, are they going to get a chance to, to be the second choice? I know Connor, many would say, won his the quadruple treble with his performance uh, at, at the penalties. And I know Big Chris put away the winning penalties, but Connor certainly uh, performed admirably. Uh, for me, no, secrets I know. It's just too many goalkeepers. Again, it's like, why invest money there when we've got all these keepers? Barkas is gone. And just made the decision to offer being a contract. You know, we're not offering him a contract to, to get rid of him. You know, if we're going to get rid of him, mm. just get rid of him. So, you wouldn't, yeah, I, for, for me, it's a no. I, I want to kind of see. I, I mean, Toby's been getting some 
great write-ups on his performances. I'd really like to see him getting a chance. I know he's been on the bench in, in Europe a few times. I'll tell you what, maybe Thursday's a chance to do that. Put Hart on the bench and shove Toby between the sticks and just let's see what he's got. Yeah, it's a, it's a possibility um, because, you know, Joe Hart is so pivotal to, to what we do just now, Patsy. And, you know, and again, like you're obviously taking a, risk, taking a risk in training with him, but probably a risk you don't need to take. Um, one of the points coming into your think really interesting is from Mappy in the comments saying priority is to get Ange signed up. Now, I've, I've seen a few people in the comments talking about this. Do you think Celtic will eventually do that, Patty? Because I think Ange, as far as I know, is in the, the, the traditional kind of years rolling contract with the club. The only manager in the past few years, I think, that got a long-term deal with, was Brendan Rodgers. I think we gave him a three- or four-year contract. Four-year um, contract, time. Is it just the case of four-year contract? Is it the case of just getting silverware over the line first before we make any decisions like that? Well, that's what happened with Rodgers. Um, you know, we won the League Cup in, the, in uh, oh, was it November or December in 2016? Won the League Cup uh, late part in the first half November. of the season. Against Aberdeen, um, and we won the league on the second of April, twenty seventeen, and I think within a week we'd given him a, given him a four year deal. So I think we probably, I think we all knew Rogers was the real deal well before that. But to get a league over the line, you know, the league was over the line in January that year anyway. But to get the league tight over the line, the board I think probably waited and then gave him a new deal. Um, if if if. I would, I'd probably give Ange a new deal just now. I mean, he's obviously got something. We're, we're only getting better. And we're bringing in quality players all the time. And you know that he's part of that. Um, so I, I'd, I'd jump at the chance to give him a new deal. Um, how long he wants to stay for, I don't know. Because, you know, he is 56. Hopefully a long time. Aye, hopefully a long time. But, you know, he is 56. So he's probably only got two or three more jobs in him. And he probably wants to manage at the top level. Um, not to say Celtic can't be at the top level, I think under Ange we probably could be, but you know, maybe one of those top five leagues or something. You just don't know his personal ambitions because you know he does say he backs himself, and I think if he didn't back himself, he wouldn't have made it to Celtic because uh, he's came in on his own. But no, mm. I'd, I'd give him what he wants um, personally, and I wouldn't wait until April or May from he left a title for us to do that. Yeah, sign him up. Um, I mean, rumor has it he's bought a dog, Declan. And, and told the Declan. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, maybe, maybe he's beside his stand for a while. Is it true, Declan? I don't know, mate. You, 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 you seem to be meeting quite a lot. If he needs it walked, I don't know. <laughs> if, he does need it, if he needs it walked, I will be more than happy to do it for him. Um, but, you know, there is a balance coming in here. You know, I'd be the, the, the opinion of both you guys that I would get him signed up. But David's coming in here to see, you know, if we give him a long deal and he fails, it costs us millions. You know, we can predict the future. I, I don't think he will fail itself. I will go out and run, say that just now. The, the flat, I think he will be successful. If somebody comes in for him and he's on a long term deal, we make millions. You know, you know, it puts a nine million compensation for Rogers. So it's, I think it's, it's the balance, isn't it? You know, if you keep him on a, a one year deal, you don't get a lot of compensation for him. If you Move him on to a longer term deal. Yeah, it costs you more if it doesn't work out, but you also get more if someone comes in to, to take him off you. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just it is a fine balance, as you say, Lawrence. You know, um, I would hope that you know, I don't think Angie's like Brendan Rodgers that he would sneak away in the middle of the night and drag everything off your uh, fireplace and put them in a bag and leave. But um, you know, I would hope that Angie's here for. A certain a, a long time, and you know, people are reminding us in the comments saying, you know, it's great to beat Rangers. We've only played them once under Ange Postecoglou. Um, he's out of two European competitions. I think you know you need to look at that Midland game and what we had in the park and throughout this group. And um, even you know the challenge that was already there with, with some teams. I know it flashes. We've looked at a good side, but again, Ange was even very honest in saying that. We weren't at that level yet. We're going to get a crack at the, the conference. Hopefully, we'll be adding players to the, the side to do it. And we've not had any silver word yet, but again, we've got a. He's given himself the best chance of doing that by putting himself in a, a final right away. Um, so, it is a, a well, long term. On the silver we must give a nod to the ladies who, who delivered the cup against Glasgow. On you go, Lawrence. Yep. You know, great to get that, that in, and hopefully, you know, the boys can do what the girls have done uh, and add a cup before the year's out. Mm. I, I think you know it's it's great for them to beat Glasgow City. They've been dominating for that for so long. So Fran Alonso's doing 
a fantastic job there. So hopefully, you know, Angie's going to do a similar job, deliver his the League Cup before the year's out. Good transfer window. And I, I think if you're still in touch at the top of a good transfer window, we'll go on and win the league. Mm-hmm. I mean, everybody's excited by the type of football he's playing as well. And look, there's not... You know, there's not loads of loan players that haven't worked out like last season. You know, at one point you're going right, Kenny loan player, Laxalt loan player, Duffy. You, you know, your team is almost built on loan players. At least he's bringing in young players that seems to be developing. They seem to be getting weak, you can weak. So, yeah, I, I, I think Ange will add Celtic second piece of silverware this season before mm-hmm. the years out just to add it to to the women's. Yep, fingers crossed he does. Um, David Kelly said to me, we'll see where we are come the second. Well, come May, and I hope I'm proving you wrong in this one, because I do think Angel will be successful at Celtic. Um, just, I was on Saturday, the weekend, and I know Lawrence was involved too. Um, thanks to everybody that, you know, was in the comments, watched the streams, donated whatever they had. It's went a long, long way. The money we've raised has been absolutely sensational. And the auction is... Uh, up on eBay just now, you can find us at Celtic State of Mind on eBay. There's some great um, uh, bits of Celtic memorabilia there that you can you can bid on, which will go to our final total um, that will go to St Mary's and St Alphonsus. Um, very important to to do that, and you know I think the scale of the money that we've raised, Patrick, has been absolutely phenomenal. And I know you want to just give a wee shout out to another cause that me and you're both part of too. Yes. Um... University of Strathclyde Celtic Supporters Club are doing, you know, I think it's our second time we've done it. It's a Christmas appeal for, you know, there's going to be a food bank collection at the, the, the student union at Strathclyde between 10 and 2. So just sort of bring along anything you can. And then on this Friday, it'll be my Twitter page, your Twitter page, and the Strathclyde Celtic Supporters Club Twitter page. You can donate any sort of cash that you want. I know we're constantly asking you for money on this because I've just been a charity weekender, but it's all for a good cause. So even if you could just retweet it and see if anyone else will donate money, just anything you've got. You know what we should be asking? Thank you very much. We should be asking Celtic to help out St Mary's where it all began. You know, if the Axholm and the rest of the Celtic pod viewers can raise over 20,000 quid, where's Celtic this? Because that that is, you know, day zero for for Celtic. That's where the club was formed. You know, Mm. where's the Celtic Charitable Foundation? You know, why aren't they stepping in and helping the St Mary's, you know, Ground zero for Celtic. It's in trouble just now. It needs the cash. You'd really expect Celtic to be stepping up. And I don't think any any of the fans would be against the Charitable Foundation stepping in and helping the parish that gave us Celtic. Uh, so, mm-hmm. yeah, again, you know, it's an easy one. You know, if the board would help the board perhaps reconnect with the fans if they could take actions like this. But we we'll won't hold our breath in, in Celtic doing it, but it'd be great if they could. And it I think also we've got the, the auction online as well now, the Axel yep. auction. There's some signed goods there uh, to hit, try and raise a wee bit more for the parish. But I think yeah. Paul John will be tweeting all that out as well. Yep. As I say, the auction is up in eBay. You can find us at a Celtic state of mind. There's signed Danny McGrain memorabilia up there, George Conley memorabilia, like Bertie Old. I think there's a signed jersey from, from Bertie and there's some other great pieces. Um, so check that out if you can. Um, and thanks again for all the comments today, thanks to everybody that tuned in over the weekend, thanks to everybody that donated, and to Lawrence Conley and Patrick McGill, thank you for joining me in a Celtic State of Mind. 